Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Nick Lornay. How are you, my friend? Very good. It's lovely to see you again. It is lovely to be back here. Yeah. You have a rather wonderful view. It's actually a big hologram. Oh, it's a big hologram? Yeah, it's projected from my house. Oh. Yeah, we can change it to, you know, yeah. Paris if we want. But... Let's, let's do Hawaii. Okay. And with the, with the beach minute. just there, yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, it's rather beautiful. You're up here in the Hollywood Hills. Yep. Yeah, I bought uh, this house about 11 years ago, and I love it up here. And I watch the clouds go by, and I can see the ocean on a clear day. And yeah, it's good. Beautiful. Yeah. And this is where you mix? Yeah, nowadays I mix here because of mainly budget reasons. I used to obviously mix on an analog desk uh, and, and would still love to do that. Uh, but, you know, budgets on, on the type of records and artists I like, uh, they don't have that kind of budget anymore. Right. So, so I tend to, to spend the majority of the money that I, that's available for these records on the recording. So I go to Sunset Sound. Uh, is my favorite one here. Uh, I go to other ones, but that one's sort of my favorite in uh, Studio 3. And, and basically go there for about two weeks and record uh, the band at their best, you know, with everybody in the room, with the best microphones, best sounding room, best headphones, best everything. And uh, that's where the majority of the budget on, on the record goes. I then bring it back here and I do some overdubs in, in my house if they're not too loud. I can't do really loud guitars up here, but I can do vocals. Great. And I can do obviously keyboards and all kinds of things. And yeah, all those little things that actually yep. take a long time, I do here. And then I mix it all here. And I don't, you know, it's I do it all in the box. I've managed to learn how to do that over the last uh, probably eight years. I mean, I, I used to avoid Pro Tools. I really didn't like it, um, but it's got better and better. And with with UAD, you know, replicating all the analog equipment that I, I'm used to, it's great because it comes up. I know exactly what I want and it works and it sounds, it sounds close enough. And so I get the mixes to a, a, a place where it's, I would say, 80% there where the band are like, yep, we love the mix. And then I, I do take my mixes from here on a hard drive into an analog studio and split it all up and put it back through the analog thing and add a few things and balance it, just tighten it up and, and do all that. Because, the, the, you know, this, this is just a, you know, it's like a shed. <laughs> We're in a shed kind of thing. And, it, uh, you know, it sounds okay in here, but I much prefer to be in a proper studio. I mean, like my favorite studio to mix is, is Sphere Studios, which has got a beautiful old Neve desk with 1081s and they've got every piece of equipment you can think of, you know, and they've got great A to Ds and D to As, which is very important, you know, and those things are expensive. I mean, they're really, really expensive, you know, and then the compressors that I like to use are EAR compressors, which are, you know, what are they, 18 grand for one. So you need two of those. And there's only, I don't know how many there are in the world, and they've got some. So I tend to do that. that that's sort of my ideal plan, and that keeps the budget um, doable. But I assume there's many cases where even that's not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no. I, there's quite a few records I've done recently where I just love the band and their songs so much that I'm just going, I want to do this. And it's, you know, I, you know, I have to give up a lot of, uh, what I might earn, but I'm fine with that. I'd much prefer to do that. I mean, I've just uh, mixed an album for Amel and the Sniffers, and I just love that band, you know, and that I mixed it all here. And uh, obviously, you know, Starcrawler, um, that was done at Sunset Sound. We recorded it at Sunset Sound and mixed it here. And then, you know, I, I put it through some analog equipment at another studio. And, um, you know, the, the album, another album I, I did recently that, that's going to come out later this year is with the Distillers. And the budget was, a, was better for that. They're, they're signed to a major label, so there's more money. But um, we just had more time at Sunset Sound. And then we went to various studios to do overdubs. And then I mixed it here. And then, again, went to another studio. Actually, a friend of mine called uh, Dave, Dave Way. Who we love is, Dave, yeah. Dave, yeah. Dave's great. And um, he's got a lovely home studio that's very equipped, 
you know, he's been the waste station. The waste station. He's been collecting for years, and uh, we've become very good friends. And uh, I'm quite happy to go there because he has those EAR compressors, and so I just put my mixes through his equipment, adjust a little bit, and bang, there it is. So he has those lovely Motown EQs as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and he's got uh, 1081s. And obviously, I've done a lot of very big records uh, that have earned quite a lot of money uh, for a lot of people. And, and you know, I, I, it, it's been good for me too. But I've never been one of those people that's, um, you know, been money driven. So I don't have a lot of vintage equipment myself. Um, wish I did, but I don't. And, and simply because it's so expensive. And also, you know, uh, when I started out making records a long, long, long time ago, I did, like many people, buy lots of pieces of equipment. I had you know, AMS delays and reverbs and various, various things that were popular at the time. But they don't travel very well. And the maintenance on them is ridiculous. So, and, and I'd be traveling, you know, or you know, over around Europe and to Australia and back from England, and this equipment doesn't travel. It it literally doesn't. You can't do it, and you need permission, carnets, and in the end, I just thought, right, I'm not buying any more equipment. I'm just going to rent it wherever I go. So that's what I've been, how I've been for many, many years. So I mean, I have a few, you know, nice, key pieces, nice pieces, down here, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I put my mixes through this, and you know, this I use this for vocal, this tube tech, um, and then obviously you know, tape echo and stuff like that. But, but yes, I don't have, I don't have a lot of gear, mainly because of traveling. Actually, that's probably the r real reason. Well, that, I'd love to go through your discography because it's freaking awesome. Well, it's going to take a couple of days. Yeah, it might take a couple of days. <laughs> But I realised I've been making records for 40 years. It's, it's insane. And you're 42. I'm 42. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm 38. <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but, um, yeah. So, so how did it start? Where, where were you born? Really, I mean, put simply, uh, I was born in, in London, in England. But at the age of eight, moved to the south of Spain to a, 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 a little village up in the mountains near Granada called Frigiliana. And, um, and I grew up in Spain. I did all my education in Spanish, all of it, from eight to 16. And my brother, I have a brother who's two years younger than me. My parents were very out and about, very, very um, elegant, glamorous people. And they when I was born and other things, they just decided to change their lives completely and move to this little village that had no water or electricity, halfway up a mountain. This place big called Frigiliana, big change. My life was basically, go, obviously, go to school and all that, but my house is always full of arty people and very loud rock music, uh, combined with a bit of classical music and a bit of jazz, because my dad was more into jazz and he loved theater he was a very theatrical person a very flamboyant character and um but you know there was constant s smell of hashish in the air all the time and lots of lots of uh, spanish wine was flowing and people painting huge murals they'd hang up these huge canvases and throw paint at it and it, that's 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 how I grew up, you know. So I very set, very 60s into 70s, a very 70s bohemian life. And then uh, eventually, uh, you know, well, Franco, you know, who was the dictator of Spain, died. And Spain kind of changed and the laws changed and we basically had to, had to leave. So we moved back and that was 1976, 77, punk happened. I just went out every night to to punk rock gigs, pretty much saw every punk band you could mention, apart from the Sex Pistols. I bought tickets. So you're not going to be one, one of those people that claims no, they were at the show? I was not there. At the show? No, I wasn't there. People who know what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah. you know what I'm talking and, about. Um, but I did see all these bands, and I just absolutely consumed by 
music, punk rock music in particular, because that's what that's my teenage time when I was 16. I, mean, I was 17 in 1977. So I was going out to all these gigs and I'd, I'd go, you know, you know, go and see the damned over here and go and see the vibrators here. You know, it's, it's like that. Anyway, I, I realized I really wanted to do music, but not, I didn't ever want to go on stage. I didn't want to learn an instrument, although I did learn to play guitar at school in Spain and I played guitar for the king of Spain. Very that, nice. That's a, a good claim, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I love tape machines. And my dad gave me a tape machine, uh, a reel to reel Grundig. I experimented with that when I was, you know, 10, 11. I, I sort of, I did this, um, the first thing I remember doing of, of altering sounds was I had Sympathy for the Devil, you know, the, the Rolling Stone, and it has that great percussive in, you know, intro that's sort of boom, that thing. So I played that off of a record onto the tape machine and made a loop of that. So it's just boom, forever, you know. Put that onto a cassette, dub that onto a cassette, because I had a cassette machine, which was a brand new invention at the time. And then I played that back into the tape machine with a new tape on it. And then I had a turntable and I put on the Beatles paperback writer and the vocals were all panned to one side. Uh, I think it was paperback writer, it might have been another song, but it was one of those that, you know, where the vocals are one side, the music's all the other. With, uh, you know, Nowhere, man. Stereo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I managed to, to <clears throat> by putting coins on, on the turntable, slow it down. So it was the same tempo as the, the Stones. So I did this mashup of the Stones yeah. with, and the Beatles vocals. And I kept, I, it kept going out, of course. I'd edit, I'd keep a bit. So I did that. And I just loved all the, you know, the, meter, the little meters and lights going on and tape and all that stuff. So, of course, later on, I thought, I want to work in a recording studio. And what actually happened was I was at Brave Film Studios, which is where they used to do all the Hammer Horror movies, which is out near Windsor. My dad was writing a, a film script there. They'd given him an office. So I would travel with him out of London to there. And I got a job as a gopher or, or a runner for film. And that's a whole other story. But there was a recording studio there. And Throbbing Gristle, if you remember, Throbbing Gristle and Wild Willie Barrett, and John Otway. <laughs> John Otway, yeah, wow. Yeah, uh, were made records there. And I used to just sit outside listening. And I could hear, you know, the drums on their own, the guitars on their own. And I'd never heard this before. And, and eventually the, uh, the owner of the studio who was, had very long hair, he was an absolute hippie when at this point everybody had short punk hair kind of thing. And his name is Adam. I still remember his name. And so he said, why don't you just come in? So I came in and just sat in the corner watching all this and I loved it. I saw all the meters going. I, under, I understood enough about what was going on. I thought, that's what I want to do. And so uh, eventually got a, a job at Tape One Studios, which was more of an editing room and copying room in, in the middle of London. And the owners were fantastic people. They were very encouraging. A guy called Bill Foster and Barry Ainsworth. Barry Ainsworth, if anybody knows the Trogs tape, awesome. right? Mm -hmm. when, when, he, <laughs> when, when you listen to that, I'll he say, goes, bish bash, here, bish bosh. Here, play it from the top, Barry. <laughs> you oh, hear him. That's Barry. Barry was the assistant engineer oh. on that. He was the guy who pushed record and recorded the Trogs tape. Bish bash, Barry bish Ainsworth. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen him for. 40 years. I'm, but anyway, lovely guys. I haven't heard the tro Trogs tapes in years. I'm going to go back and dig oh, them out. I've got to. It's hilarious. I would get master tapes, you know, two track mixes of an album, usually mastered, and then copy it for France, copy it for Spain, copy it for Germany with different, uh, you know, standards that they had. And that's how music got distributed around the world. And then they go to the various you know, vinyl plants. And so it, it was a very accurate, you had to be super accurate. You had to know all about tape machines and lining them up. So I got a really good training in, in tape machines and distortion levels and all that and hiss levels and all that. But I also learned how to edit really well. 
because I used to edit songs. Uh, people would come in and they go, oh, we would need to shorten this by 30 seconds. And, and I was actually, even though I was a teenager, I was making decisions about editing songs down, which was hilarious when you think about it. So I got a really good training of arrangement. You know, I understood. Um, in, do you remember um, KTEL? Of course. So KTEL in England used to put out these Top of the Pops records where they'd have 10 songs on each side, 20 songs on one vinyl, which is impossible. You can't do it. You have to shorten all the songs to two and a half minutes. My job. And, and a, there was another couple of guys in, who had other rooms. But we were basically given these copies of these songs and had to shorten them. So I'm making decisions like, okay, people remember the intro, right? You remember the intro of a song. Lyrically, you remember the first verse. Chorus one and chorus two are pretty similar usually. Verse two, you know, if we're going to have to chop a minute out of this song, well, just chop from the beginning of, of chorus one to the beginning of chorus two. Right there, you've chopped out a minute. That's probably it. But sometimes you have to chop out more because some songs aren't arranged that way. So I was making artistic decisions, brutal ones, to make up these, these KTEL records, which was crazy. But in doing so, I really learned how to edit very well. In comes, right, I'm there, and in comes this new song. No one's ever heard it. It's not been released yet. And it was a disco song with a kind of punk rock edge. It sounded a little bit like Iggy Pop, but it was a disco song. And it had this guy kind of talking rather than singing, and he had a low voice. And I thought this song was just great. And it came, you know, the single version, which is, say, three and a half minutes long, and the instrumental version, same length. So I decided, just for my own fun, to edit between the two and make a, 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 a sort of another version of it. So the, I made the intro longer, and it was probably me rebelling against shortening these songs. I thought, I'll make this one longer. And then I took the left side and delayed the right side and made it do these strange delay things and phasing. And I just made this Frankenstein version of this song. Okay. And so I was there until 3 a.m. And knock, knock, knock. My, uh, the, the main uh, mastering guy, because there was a mastering, there was a mastering room there. Uh, and his name was Dennis Blackham. He met, went by the name of Bilbo Bopper. He was very famous. Uh, probably Bilbo it still Bopper. is. And if you look on, on our vinyl from the 70s or 80s, you'll see Bilbo Bopper. And that's he was the master engineer. Lovely guy. He knocked on the door, goes, hey, what, what are you still doing here? What are you up to? You're not working, are you? You know, kind of thing. And I said, no, I'm just playing around with this song. I really like it. And he said, oh, which song is that? And I said, it's this, it's this, this um, pop music song. He says, oh, it's great, isn't it? He says, I'm mastering it tomorrow. And he said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just, you know, I've just made up a different version of it just for fun. And he goes, oh, let's hear it. So Dennis came around and I played it to him really loud. He was like, this is great. This is really good. How, how did you, you know? And he said, I, I, I know the singer really well. It's a guy called Robin Scott. He's coming in tomorrow to master it. Um, I'll play it to him. I said, are you kidding? I've just butchered his song up. And he said, no, 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 I'll play it to him. And, you know, I was 18. So, and this guy was, a, you know, a really, you know, very respected mastering engineer. I mean, he was kind of my boss as well. Anyway, next day, knock, 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 you know, about 6 p.m. They'd mastered, I guess, the single versions. And uh, Dennis goes, um, oh, I've got that, the singer. Robin's here. And so in, in comes Robin, and he's looked very like Brian Ferry. He had a lovely suit, handsome, you know, confident man. Uh, comes in and says, oh, hi, I've, um, I've just heard Dennis just played me your version, because I gave Dennis a, a copy that night. And he said, I really love it. And I go, oh, well, I'm, I'm really happy, because I thought, I thought you'd hate it. And he said, no, no. He said, it's, um, it's really interesting because I've just come back from America and I've been hanging out with Malcolm McLaren and people over there. And in the clubs, they're playing these extended versions on 12-inch vinyl, which was unheard of, right? 12-inch single didn't exist. 
And he said, so I'm as a gimmick, he said, I'm going to put out a 12 inch version of this song. And you've just done this six and a half minute long version or five and a half, whatever it was. Uh, do you mind if I use it? And I, like, do I mind if you use, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, no problem. Anyway, a few months later, the song Pop Music by M comes out, goes to number one in England, right? Huge hit. And it went to number one pretty much everywhere in the world. And while it was up number one, they released the 12 inch single, the first ever commercially released 12 inch single came out. And it says on it, my name. It says, it says, pop music, M, Nick Lorne Nix. It's called the Nix Mix, N-I-X-M-I-X. And it says Nick Lorne there. Amazing. And so that came out and it kept that song at number one for weeks. And the DJs were so fed up at this point of playing the single version, they played the long version because people loved this song. I mean, it's the song that Ghostbusters copied. Sure. You know, yeah. ding, 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 and it's yeah. radio video. You know, it's that song. That was extraordinary for me because suddenly I, there was this big hit record with my name on it out there. And if you actually go to uh, Spotify and type in that song, the 12 the inch version comes up, not the single, and it's got my name on it. I mean, I don't get any credits for all those records that I've made, you know, Spotify are pretty terrible at crediting record producers. But that one, I'm actually credited in the title. It's the weirdest thing. First thing I ever did. It's, it's amazing. And it's like it's Absolutely got this. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, uh, it's a fun thing. I, I so what it. does that do for your career? Well, what happened then is I realized I wasn't get, learning anything new apart from editing and that. And I really wanted to record bands. A new studio in London opened up called The Townhouse, which belonged to Richard Branson, Virgin. And it was Virgin Records' own studios, brand new. And they were hiring. Dennis, who became a real champion for me, he told me about The Townhouse that had just opened. And uh, he said, you should meet Mike Howlett. And Mike Howlett was this uh, very popular you know, record producer, did a lot of sort of new wave records like um, the flock of seagulls, you know. Uh, I uh, what's it called? When I am, I ran. I, I, I ran. ran. I ran. That's it. Away. Great, great record. And he like there was other bands like uh, oh, OMD. He did all the early orchestral maneuvers. Uh, Fisher Z. He worked with Martha and the Muffins. Mm. A lot of cool stuff. So I met him, and he's still one of my closest friends to this day. Like, really love. Mike, he's great. So he met me and he, he, Dennis had told him the pop music thing that I'd done. So he had been working at the townhouse, knew, uh, well, he probably did know Richard Branson, but he talked to the chief engineer there. Anyway, I managed to get an interview. Okay, so I went there for the interview. And the chief engineer at the time was Mick Glossop, who's another great you know, record producer. And I knew who Mick Glossop was because I'd seen his name. So I couldn't believe I was actually meeting this record producer. I just met Mike Howlett. Now I'm meeting Mick Glossop. It was incredible. And we had this strange interview where I was very enthusiastic about wanting to work there. And he said, well, what, what, have, what, what knowledge do you have? And I told him about editing and I told him about pop music. And he didn't quite believe me, but I had a copy of it. So I said, and he's like, oh, wow. That's, you know. He said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a record producer. And he said, well, you, what, what do you think that is? So I explained what I thought the record producer is. And I said, and, and I said well, if I get a job here, could, am I allowed to use the studio for free on the days off if I find a band? And he laughed. He thought that was a really cocky thing to say. And he said, look, you're not going to get any time off. There is no, this is a very popular studio. There's no downtime. And I said, well, if, let's say, there was some downtime, or could I bring a band in at midnight and work through the night? And he said, you, you're really, you really want to do this, don't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really want to make records. And anyway, got the gig. Uh, I got the gig. And then, you know, in the townhouse, there was 
I mean, honestly, the jam, Queen, Adam and the Ants, you know, I mean, you, you name it. Every, every great band that was really like interesting was, was working there. And they had two studios when I worked there. They then built another one, so there was three. But, um, but yeah, I got really lucky. I got that gig. And then it really all happened for me because um, there was this session booked with Public Image with Johnny Rotten and his new band. And uh, no, none of the assistant engineers that worked there, there were four of us, and I was the youngest news, wanted to do this session because John had been obnoxious to them in the past and they just didn't like him. I, on the other hand, couldn't. Yeah, you know, they were one of my favorite bands. And obviously I hadn't experienced anything, so I didn't know. When the manager said, All right, well, will you, you know, we'll put you on the session. I was delighted. So it was a weekend thing. One day, John Lydon, Johnny Rotten arrived, and you know, uh we and it had an engineer. And it was a a sort of he was a dub kind of reggae mixer. What happened was that he had never used this particular mix mixing desk you know uh which was a, a a prototype ssl it was called the b series and there were only a few made and the townhouse what had the second one and so it wasn't very clear a lot of the labeling was a bit odd there was some to, in order to engage some of the echo sends you had to pull the knob up which had never that that was unusual uh, obviously, SSL became one of the most popular desks in the world about a year or two later and was everywhere and everybody knew how to use them. But at this point, people didn't really know them, right? So if you can imagine this thing where you've got the engineer at the desk, I'm at the back of the room because I'm the tape op, right? This is before digital. So you needed a tape op to operate the tape machine, rewind, all that, it, you know, you did have a control at the desk, but it was the tape ops job to do that because it sped things up. So, and John was sitting there in, in an armchair that he bought up and he had <laughs> this crate of red stripe beer. He was just chugging back the red stripe with his orange spiky hair and his tartan, you know, uh, trousers and all that. And I would go up every time this guy would say, hey man, this doesn't, this knob doesn't work. And I go up and I said, no, you, you pull it up. You know, you just pull the knob up and that switches it on and I'd go back. And then he, you know, five minutes later, hey, this one doesn't work either. And I'd go, no, you, you pull it up, you turn it and you pull it up. And, I, and, and then there was other switches. And basically I was going backwards and forwards. At one point, John says to me, um, here, what's your name? And I go, it's Nick. And he says, well, Nick, get your fucking chair. Put it up near the desk because you're going backwards and forwards like a fucking yo-yo and you're making me dizzy. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, okay. So I took my high chair because it was, you know, you had a, the chair was high to operate the tape machine. And put it so I'm, the engineer's here, I'm up here. And every time the engineer couldn't work out something, I'd reach over and do it. The engineer at some point gets up to go and have a piss, goes, you know, leaves the room. John gets up and locks him out and looks at me and goes, go on. You know what you're doing. Make it sound good. I was like, he says, yeah. he says, you've been doing it everything anyway. Just sit down in the chair and do it. So I start, I had some ideas, you know. I thought, well, the snare could have an echo on it. This could be there. The bass could come. I start doing this. And I paused at one point and I looked at John. And he said, why are you stopping? And I said, well, I don't want to mess up what he's done. He's the engineer. He goes, you ain't fucking done nothing. <laughs> you know, he's, and then bang, 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 you know, engineer comes back, trying to get in, the door's locked. <laughs> He's like, let me in, man. And um, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's the engineer says, hey, the door's locked. Can you unlock the door, you know? Uh, and, and, and John goes, hey, is that him? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, give it here. And he says, hello, can I help you? You know, and uh, he says, yeah, man, the door's locked. Can you lock, unlock the door? You know? He says, yeah, well, we're making music in here. It's more than you fucking know how to do, so fuck off home. <laughs> <Bonk>. <laughs> and that was, you know, and then basically I just spent the rest of the, the day 
mixing this track and and you know it, it, it you know there's there's more to the story i could tell you but basically i finished that song and it was sent to virgin and they loved it and it came out and so then which song is this i think it's called home is where the heart is very shortly after that happening john called the townhouse and booked me to do the album the, the, the next album, which ended up being The Flowers of Romance. And I, we just got, all got on so well. And it, it was, I mean, it was a very bizarre album. Um, I mean, I remember him being interviewed and someone saying, it's, it's very avant, it's very avant-garde. And he said, yeah, avant got a clue. Which I thought was great. Avant-garde a clue. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there was, no demos, no writing. It just, they came in and things were recorded and I edited and looped and I did, did what I had learned to do. And in the end, uh, this, there was all these rough mixes that I did each night. I did a rough mix of whatever we'd done. The next thing I know, it's like I get this call and, oh, can you take the mixes around to the mastering room to master it? And I said, we haven't mixed it yet. And they said, no, the, the band are really happy with the roughs that you did. And that is the record. And then what happened, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to cut the long story short here, but, but basically it came out and Keith insisted that I get a credit. So they, they pressed the record, came out with no credits at all to anybody. There was no credits, period, nothing. And then they, Virgin then re-released it with my name on it, with a thanks thing. And John got asked in, 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 in an interview in the NME about the, uh, the, the strange dr drum sounds and the bizarre sound of this record, because it really was quite odd. And he said, oh yeah, it's this young guy called Nick Launay produced it. He used the words. And that changed everything because no one produced that record really, you know, I mean, it, it happened, but but did I have a part in the production? Absolutely, the, the sound production definitely. So you know, but he he basically talked about me, and uh, then one thing led to another, and Killing Joke called up, wanting th those sounds that similar, and they booked the Townhouse Studio Two, the same studio, and I did uh, the you know, Killing Joke's second album, which is called What's This For? And then, Fantastic the, then album. the Gang of Four, I did To, to Hell With Poverty. Mm -hmm. So this was all because of Flowers of Romance, the, all these cool bands mm -hmm. that were in a you know, similar audience, let's say, heard about me and, and, and came. I had no manager. I didn't get paid for this stuff because I didn't know how to be paid. I didn't know anything. You just got paid your fee that you would as an assistant for or yeah, an engineer? Yeah, which was £27 a week. <laughs> so yeah, for, for what's this for, I got paid £27 a week. Wow. No royalty? No. No contract, nothing. I mean, on, on what's this for, I'm not even credited. There is no credit on that. Um, you know. Well, that's punk rock, that's, isn't it? It is very punk rock. <laughs> that Gang of Four, different. Gang of Four... Was, I had, that was my first contract, the G Gang of Four for um, To Hell With Poverty and, and, a, and a song called Credit, uh, which is a great single. I'm really very proud of that one. Um, I'm credited and uh, I got royalties. I still get royalties. That was a proper thing. I did a song, for uh, two songs for The Slits. Uh, birthday Party, the same. So basically, after Killing Joke and not getting paid and credited, someone said, you know, you should be getting paid for Did this. you get a manager or did you just figure Not, out? Not then, no. Nope. Still, I carried on, but, you know, I got advice from friends and some things happened. And uh, uh, so I had a lawyer. I was told, uh, Dennis Muirhead, who is a very famous uh, record lawyer, he helped me out early on, props to him. And, um, yeah, and it's, you know, after a while, I got into the swing, the swing of it. And, um, you know, and, and, and another thing that happened, which is very interesting, another thing uh, was uh, the, the birthday party. 
who were an unknown band from Australia, came over to do some gigs in London and they were on 4AD records. And this, the guy who ran uh, 4AD was Ivo. And he was a big fan of the Flowers of Romance records. So he got in touch with me and said, I've got this new band and they, they like the Flowers of Romance and they, they're really difficult to work with. And, <laughs> uh, you know, but then again, John Lydon's very difficult and Keith Levine's, you know, you've worked with a lot of different, would you might, would you have a go? I, I said, well, what are they like? And he said, well, I'll, I'll send you a, a live recording. And they sent this thing and it was like, you know, this absolute cacophony of noise, but it was fantastic. <laughs> and it sounded like vampires to me. It was like, it was all, rawr, <laughs> you know, and I thought it was great. So um, I agreed to it. And then the budget, there was no budget. There was hardly, but Townhouse was an expensive studio. So I talked to the manager, I said, could, could this band, could I produce a record with this band after midnight and have cheap studio time so I was literally this so I was producing some of these bands but also assisting as an assistant engineer still on on like Phil Collins records or things like that and then at, at night tear down that you know session finished with whoever it was uh, as an assistant and then right and I get so I get this phone call as I'm tidying up uh, from reception saying, um, hey, Nick, um, I think one of your bands has arrived. And he, he, he said, could you come up and get them because they're scaring people. <laughs> so I go up and sure enough, there's the birthday party it was Nick Cave and, you know, Mick Harvey. And they were all very well dressed in suits, but completely disheveled hair and eyeliner. And they looked like vampires. vampires yeah. They really yeah, looked I like remember vampires. well. I mean, they were all like... Nick Cave looked. still looks like a vampire. Yeah. And so that's when I first met them. And, you know, we went down to the studio, set up, and we basically recorded this... The antithesis of being Australian, which you think of like blonde yeah. hair and tans oh, yeah, totally. and surfing and Barbies. Yeah. And they're like... Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean... They, yeah, you know, fantastic, fantastic look and um and everything and uh, it came down. We did this song called "Release the Bats," which has became one of the. It, it is one of the most anthem. You know, it's, it's a gothic anthem. If you go to any goth club anywhere in the world, which I do often, I mean they'll they'll play it. Or there's a lot of there's actually that and Bella Lugosi is dead. Aren't yeah, it's yeah. those two. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, Bella Lugosi is probably. It's much more famous than, than no, but it's right the bats, but it's up there. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. and there's a, there's there's clubs called Release the Bats. There's there's one here in in Long Beach. Yeah, it's it's funny how this this stuff happens, you know. But you know, but we literally recorded the two songs. There's Release the Bats and Blast Off. We recorded them in one night, and then I had to tidy up and then assist in a, a session, and then the band came back and we mixed the two songs. I mean, I didn't sleep for four days, but I was 20 years old, 20, maybe 21 at that point. I think I was 20 when I did Flowers of Romance and then all these other ones. The other great thing that happened at the townhouse around that time was, was Kate Bush. And, and so the, the thing with that uh, was Hugh Padgham, who I had learned everything from. I mean, I had assisted Hugh Padgham and Steve Lillywhite on... Uh, the Black sea, XTC's Black Sea album. And then there were a couple other records that Steve came in to do that I assisted on with Hugh. So I learnt how to engineer and how to Did you work on Melt? On which one? Melt, Peter Gabriel 3? No, no, but I started at the townhouse right when that was finish, finishing. Like literally, I think I started the week that finished. Right. And I heard that drum sound like on Intruder. And I remember playing back. There was a, there was a playback party. And I, I was in charge of one tape machine and pushing play to play back the songs and then change the reel and play back the next side. And so that's Hugh was there, obviously, and Peter Gabriel was there and all that. And, uh, and Kate Bush, I think. No, she didn't turn up. But anyway, it was, it was like a playback party, which was great and 
that's the first time I heard that record. And that song, Intruder, just changed. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's one of the most extraordinary sounding songs I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. It's still to this day when I listen to it. And if you listen to the Flowers of Romance album, and if you listen to the song, uh, there's a song called Four Enclosed Walls. If you listen to that drum sound, which is kind of bah, 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 bah. it's this gated room. All it is is this incredible stone room that's in Townhouse Studio 2. Um, but the room mics, which were two 87s, compressed to death through the SSL desk, which had these very vicious compressors built in. Um, and, it, and, and they had gates on them. So as long as you didn't have any overhanging cymbals or hi-hats and played a part that was basically just kick and snare or toms, like, so it's like, it's like this sound, and that's what Intruder is. And that drum sound, I was like, that's the best drum sound ever. And it is the best drum sound ever. Yeah. And it's the same exact sound. Phil Collins played drums on Intruder, right? So yeah. Phil Collins then came back to that very studio and employed Hugh as, as the record producer and did the In The Air Tonight, which I was as an assistant on. So I was there when Phil went, all that. So I learned how to get that drum sound through Hugh. And it's honestly very simple to get, but you wouldn't guess it. You know, you couldn't listen to it and go, oh, I know how is that. A lot of people think it's like a gated reverb. They it's do, not. yeah. And people started to imitate it in the 80s yeah. by using a reverb yeah. and gating a reverb. Well, the AMS, uh, the company AMS had bought out the AMS reverb shortly after that. And there was a non-lin setting and Hugh helped them put that together. So it is, and it, and it actually, you know what, it, it, as far as recreating it in a box, it's, the, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad at all, but it is not that room. That stone room is just the most incredible. I mean, I've, I've worked in lots and lots of studios around the world and I often find these studios that have a stone room that they don't use. It's a storage room or something, and I, I can get that sound there. Um, but you have to play to it. You can't just play any old drum part. You have to. When I interviewed Hugh, he said that uh, they, the tempo was specifically for Intruder was built around the decay of the room. All right. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm yeah. sure they, you know, I could imagine it all in, you know, you hear that, the drummer would hear that sound. Sorry. Well, that's what happened to see with, with, with uh, Four Enclosed Walls, which is the first song on Flowers of Romance, which is incredible. It's basically just a drum track and a vocal. And then there's a couple of little noises of backwards pianos and stuff. But it's, it's basically a drum beat. The reason Martin Atkins, who's a phenomenal drummer, I mean, one of my favorite drummers, I got that drum sound because I loved that drum sound. There was no songs. So he went out there, heard that type sound, and played boom, 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 ba, 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 boom, boom, boom. And so he wouldn't have played that if that sound didn't exist. And I wouldn't have been able to tweak that sound if I didn't have a drummer playing something. So that's how that song came about. So yeah, what happened was Hugh, after that, uh, you know, he came, obviously he was in that studio, I was in that studio you know we were doing this kind of thing and so hugh started to do kate bush's record that became the dreaming right and because kate bush had heard and seen what hugh did on the peter gabriel album and she does guest vocals on that on uh games without frontiers so so she wanted hugh to engineer and so he did he started doing that record and but then he got the a call well he he had already got a call from the police to produce now obviously faced with engineering a record or produce the police who are one of the biggest bands on planet earth at the time obviously he 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 went that way um which was very difficult i think for him because he you know kate bush was a huge artist and a great artist she just wanted an engineer that could get those sounds and i knew how to get those sounds so he recommended me, told her that I'd done this Flowers of Romance album. She listened to that, liked it. And then I was booked to engineer The Dreaming. So I spent about, 
a month and a half. So I recorded all, all the whole album, apart from the drums and things on a few, on two two songs, I think, two or three songs that Hugh had done. Um, and that was just an amazing experience. I mean, I Kate totally Bush. Imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it was it was incredible because she would come in and it's like, you know, she was what twenty. 21 at the time. Maybe she was 22. I was 21. I mean, and she'd come in and she just, it was like, it's like a fairy, you know, or, or she was in a fairy land or in this mystical, she had her own pl planet, that she, she, you know, and she would come in and had a, lots of bars of chocolate and, and hashish and the combat and she'd just say, Nick, can we do this? How about we do that? And she had this great, you know, great drummer, uh, Preston Heyman. And she would play piano and he'd play drums and she'd do vocals. That's pretty much how the tracks. Del Palmer was there and played bass. And, and so, yeah, we just did the whole of the dreaming. And the, I didn't mix the dreaming. Uh, and and she, she basically got the album. It was, let's say, 70% done at the townhouse. And then she went off and did more vocals and string. Yeah, added more and more and more at her home studio because her home studio was being built. And I think the album didn't come out for a while. It seemed like a long time, but maybe it was about a year before it came out. But when out. you're like 21 or 22, that's eternity. Eternity. I, yeah. You know, I was waiting, waiting and wondering what would happen because she was quite reclusive and, you, you know, you know, m m very mystical being. I heard that John Kelly said on the first thing that they ever recorded that he just knew straight away she was in control. Oh, yeah. Even at like 17. Oh, yeah. That year... 1981 mm -hmm. it was incredible because i did gang of four killing joke public image the slits birthday party and kate bush <laughs> i'd be happy with any one of those albums it's, it, it's it, but it's it's ridiculous and i was living at home, i was living at home with my mum and my brother I mean, I, I, you know. But you weren't going home very much. You must no, have been sleeping a lot on the couch, much. studio couch. But, you know, it's like it's just I often think back and I thought, what if I had not uh, been put on that public image session? What if John didn't like me because he didn't like a lot of people? You know, it would have all been very different because that's what I mean, definitely pop music which again was kind of bizarre thing that happened, got me the gig, got me the job at uh, Townhouse or helped definitely. Uh, but, but the, the, the John, Johnny Rotten thing, it, that's, that was the, a moment that, you know, my, my life was going that way, bang, that happened and, and off, off we went. And I haven't stopped. I mean, if you look at the bands I'm working with now and have worked like last 10 years, 20 years, it's the same type of band those are the that's the music i love and i've been very lucky to stay I mean, like the yeah yeah yeahs the yeah yeahs are that same that you know they're the same feeling the same attitude the same absolutely they yeah, might just the love same. coming here and hearing you talk about all the albums that they grew up loving well it's you know the yeah yeah yeahs this this was this is quite a crazy story i got a call from steve lillywhite this is in the 2000s so i hadn't seen him for 10 years and you know and he was my mentor you know like you know what i mean he's someone i he's not that much older than me actually because he was 23 or something when he did susie and the banshees and all that absolutely loved the records and he's such a funny guy Hilarious. so funny and, and a, such a great record producer i mean his attitude about making records is a hundred percent what I have done, you know, I, I mean, I was extremely influenced by him and his way of making records. I watched him and how he talked to the band and his sense of humor and keeping everything fun. You know, it's a big part of record making because record making can be really stressful and actually there can be a lot of, you know, bad vibes and anger and distrust and it, it can be but if you, you just knock that on the head from get-go just keep the fun keep it fun 
sense of humor, remind everybody that we're making music. <laughs> we're not, we are changing the world, but we're not politicians, you know. He gets in touch with me out of the blue, saying, I'm now an a and I've, I've now got a label at Mercury Records in England, I think. And I'm about to sign this band, and they're your kind of band. That's how he described them to me, the Yeah Yeahs. And um, I, I really want you to do it, to do this record. And I was like, and he sent me a, a song. I was like, oh my God. It just sounds like, this is my 100% my cup of tea. And, you know, this girl singer was amazing voice and crazy guitar sounds and great drum beats and so simple but so brilliant. And, it, you know, it reminded me of Susie and the Banshees, I suppose. I was a bit like, of Chrissy yeah. Hine thrown in there. Yeah, yeah, attitude, yeah, 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 exactly. And so, uh, and I, I was like, I'm in. And then uh, he said, well, they're going to be doing a gig in L.A. because I was already living in L.A. I went to their gig. I think he put he managed to put me on the guest list. But little did I didn't know this, but they they had actually just done um, South by Southwest, and every label on planet Earth wanted them because they were so good live, and they had these catchy songs, and she looked great. They looked great. They all looked great, and was, they were wild. And it was every they, they got a massive record deal with Interscope, uh, which was not his. So he didn't sign them. Interscope signed them. So th this happened within a month or two. Of, of me but I did go to the gig and I did go up to them and I, I Karen Karen O was uh, they were they were the support band to a band called the Liars um, I, I think they were even the support to the support band. I mean they were like <laughs> no one knew who they were it was their maybe their first gig in LA it might have been I don't know but anyway I knew what they looked like I knew what they sound like loved their gig after they played Karen O had a table and she was selling merch and she would made some t-shirts that she painted and did, written on and some belts that said, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, I bought a, a belt. I still have it. Um, and she was great. And I said, right, I remember her, she was running over to their tour bus and I was like, hey, uh, is your name Karen? And she was like, you know, and she really young and, and she said yeah how did you know my name I said oh uh Steve Lillywhite and she was like Steve Lillywhite I know that name and I explained she says oh oh it's all very confusing to them and then I met Nick Zinner and here's what happened this is really funny so Nick Zinner is one of my best best friends in the universe ever right we hang out all the time we go to clubs together he has a house near here but this was my first meeting with him very shy. He's a very shy person, very quiet person, but very social too. So he's this odd, quiet, but he's very, very, very friendly, you know, and, and just a beautiful, a beautiful human. They all are in that band. And uh, I found him because I wanted to meet him, you know, to make sure that I got to do their record and talked very nervously together i was shy he was shy and i gave him this cd that had you know public image gang of four killing joke birthday party on it right because i thought he'll hear this and he'll realize what i do and it's going to be his their cup of tea clearly because they're highly influenced by this music and that's how i'll managed to get to do their record. I give him the CD and feel very proud that I've managed to be bold and do this. And he goes, oh, this is great. And he looks and the title's there. And he says, oh, these are some of my favorite songs. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm glad you know. Anyway, then we, okay, well, nice meeting, bye. And then nothing happens. They end up doing their first record with someone else. And it later transpires that Nick didn't realize I'd done those songs. He thought it was me compiling my favorite songs. <laughs> <laughs> and just giving like, these are my favorite songs. I hope they're your favorite songs. He didn't know that I'd produced them and engineered them. 
So it's like, oh, do you really have to, you know. You have to spell it out. Well, well, you, you need to spell it out. <laughs> well, you do. I mean, it, it, you know, why, how, why would he have known that? There's no reason. He, I mean, so anyway, but then, of course, I did get to work with them and uh, made two albums with them and uh, two, two and a half albums because there's an EP called Is Is, which I think is one of my favorite records ever that I've ever done is this EP called Is 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 definitely my favorite thing that I've done with them. I mean, there's, there's the It's Blitz album, which was, you know, has um, Heads Will Roll and Zero on it. So it's, it's a, you know, a successful record for them. And um, that's a great, I love that record. But, um, but yeah, it's just been non-stop. Well, congratulations on being non-stop. Well, thank you. I'm going to go and have a sleep now. No. <laughs> for a couple of years for and then a couple come back of years up. yeah i can't stop it, it it is it is an addiction doing these records i keep th threatening to stop but it hasn't quite happened yet but you know but yeah i mean i'm just um i've got three albums that i've done that haven't come out during the pandemic and they're all going to come out later this year so that's going to be fun so maybe i'll take a holiday while they come out but you can't because you're going to make a record now. That's true. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Nick, thank you very so much. Well, thank you for inviting me onto it was a lot your, of fun. Onto your one, into your wonderful world. Ah, well, and vice versa. Um, the course is fantastic with Starcrawler. I think it, how, how long did it end up being? 10 hours, 12 hours? Blimey. Yeah. Wow. Which is that, wow. you know, considering how many hundreds of hours of footage. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, that was so great. I mean, Starcrawler, one of my favorite bands ever you know and i just love them so much and so yeah thanks for for organizing that because to go into that studio where you know we did their their uh, album there and to go back into the same studio and with them and record that song is just it was so much fun i really enjoyed doing that well, we should do more i mean i, I love yeah. this whole kind of process where we can create a course out of something but we also at the same time also get a band yeah, a recording yeah. that sounds amazing yeah Kind of no, win -win. So, I mean, it's fantastic. When you told me about the idea, I thought, yes, let's do it. Yeah. So thank, thank you. Thank you. That. Any comments and questions below, please leave them down there. And once again, Nick, thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Farewell. Au revoir. Au revoir. Adios. And make good music. Actually, just make music. Make all kinds of music. The more rebellious, the better. Mm -hmm.